Well, good morning, You're afternoon, afternoon evening, Radio late Radio night. On uh, the International Community Radio Network. Guess I should wait for the sweeper to stop. But I uh, want to welcome you all to the United We Strike Radio Marathon for August already. August of 2014. It's uh, one of those things, you know, time just seems to move along when you're having fun. Uh, my name is Gary Hendershot, and I am broadcasting to you live from my secret underground bunker just a little bit south of Washington, D.C., and my first guests for this evening are going to be Am Rosen and Dean Lloyd, and if you'll hold on just a moment, I'll bring them live. Okay, guys, I think it's all yours at this point. Take care. Oh, thank you, Gary. Hello, everybody, and... Uh Greetings and welcome to the United We Evolve portion of today's United We Strike Marathon. My name is Am Rosen, philosopher, author, health consultant, and through the medium of the human psyche, my art is facilitating the evolution and unfoldment of human potential. Along with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Dean Lloyd, we are here peddling comprehensive intelligence to our planetary citizenry. So allow me to set the tone for today's uh, transmission. As a boy, my father often said to me, Son, if you want to be a romantic and an idealist in this world, then you're going to have to learn to deal with the confusion of others, or they won't leave you alone long enough to pursue your interests. In other words, so to speak, hold back the social inequities with one hand while you forge ahead to develop the means to actualize your potential with the other and, necessarily, strike an adaptive balance between those two ongoing conditions. Be a romantic? Well, yes. Don't we all long to embrace the living process to its fullest, to engage the flows of circumstance with enthusiasm, passion, joy, to make our lives into an ever-expanding movement through satisfaction to fulfillment? Many times I've said to people, I'm having a love affair with life, and whoever gets in my way becomes part of my love affair. And as to being an idealist, hmm, well, how about to form a more perfect union? Not to have actually achieved a means of social interaction that's been perfected to the acme of all possible social betterment. Rather, a union that could allow us to provide for the general welfare, promote the general welfare, provide for the common defense, and secure the blessings of peace and prosperity. But still, that became an envisioned goal as to the next step in human social betterment. An ideal can set us up to set up the interactive parameters, which in turn can form the guidelines for what kind of social processes will hopefully, possibly, enable us to make an ideal into a functionally practical everyday reality. United, coming together for a common purpose in order to take an action, Coming together to see things in a particular perspective that can make sense out of things and facilitate the further unfolding of potential in the most beneficial way for the well-being of all concerned. It's been said that there is nothing stronger than an idea whose time has come. I say that the time has come for the human species to free itself from the semi-repressed, half-hysterical, counterproductively irrational, subconscious, Stone Age emotional reactive patterns that have kept us teetering on the ragged edge between the destructive horrors of conflict 
and the progressive betterment of inclusively integrated individual and social competency. So, united, we strike. We start to strike against those short-sighted, expedient compromises and the resulting social inequities, which not only so unfairly lessen the quality of life, but more insanely threaten the continued existence of life itself. However, every organism and or organized system that comes into existence must perpetuate itself against the possibility of its failure and demise. Fighting against the negative, ironically, even fighting the good fight, can perpetuate an outmoded and incompetent system. Of course, it's also true that united, we evolve. Creatively, we bring into the light of understanding the insights, perspectives, techniques, and procedures which will functionally expand our species' potential to the next more inclusively integrated quality of human interaction. I'd suggest that the um, best perspective from which to strike a productive balance between what is destructively obsolete and what can facilitate more competent access is you're either going where you want to go or you're getting rid of whatever seems to be impeding your forward progress. So there's nothing negative. Everything that isn't working is just a misunderstanding of how to more adequately deal with it. What's in our way? On this marathon, we take a comprehensive look at the critical screw-ups threatening all of us, which in turn begs the consideration in the most positively productive sense. Where are we going? What are we trying to achieve? And what is the most appropriate, adequate, and effective means which will transform and revitalize our existing conditions? So, Let's start to consider the better quality of life we intend to achieve through the motivating factors, the organizing principles, the value systems we've created, and the coping mechanisms we resort to that can facilitate the efforts of our intentions. That's what we want to talk about today. Dean, please jump in and, and share your perspective with us. Hi, and it's great to be with you again, Am, and... Hello, everybody on the United We Strike. I'm looking forward to talking about today's program because we have so oftentimes been led down the path of unable to resolve our problems. And that comes with the medical model so very often. I myself have been in practice 26 years. I'm an inventor, professor, radio show host, an author, and being in practice doing a variety of different disciplines, including oxygen detoxification therapy, oriental medicine. I've realized that over the years, I had been, with all of the training, been convinced early on that I was somehow not going to resolve these problems that have been facing humanity. Because in medicine, I was amazed at how much energy and time was spent and attention was being spent on being ill. And I would think, well, where, where's the next attack coming from? And is it going to be, uh, you know, this virus or is it going to be this cancer? And, and it's the amount of diseases that have just been multiplying, what is the trend that is causing this? And I have to ask the logical question of how are we becoming so susceptible? So much fear was behind the education process. I often wonder where we're going with so many of diseases and, and the complicated therapy. Drugs would be interacting with other drugs and then they would be added somehow justified for a patient taking 12 or more drugs. It was just going to places of insanity. So I have to come back to the question, why have we been on this path? 
Why is it so short-sighted? And Am and I were going to be talking about this. What has made us so susceptible? We're already exhausted mentally as a public, and we need to focus the energy in a direction that's appropriate for what we want now. And that's where we're going to head. So, Am, let's go with it. Oh, thanks, Dean. All right. So, you know, I often tell people, you know, when I'm working with them, there's only one of you inside there. But some of the circuits that you're dealing with were set into place. You were arrested at pre-cognitive levels, before you could think things through, before you had both the capability, your nervous system hadn't developed it yet, and you had the tools, intellectual, psychological, whatever, that could help you think things through. Later, as your intellect developed more and you learned to socially adapt, you had ideas. Well, gee, I, this is the way I'd like to be. Uh, I don't want to put up with that. This is how I, I would feel. But no matter how brilliant your thoughts were, even if you could find absolute sci uh, scientific validation for what you wanted to be, you still didn't feel that way. And that is the big problem that everybody right now is facing. The more the intellect develops, and we want to develop it, it's a great tool for, for seeing what's possible, for referencing things, putting them into space, into, into perspective. The more it develops, the more these primitive reactive patterns that we've been passing on generation to generation that are locked in our subconscious, the more they battle each other. And our bodies bear the brunt of it. You know, I, I often say you wouldn't choose to get up on a nice day and say, gee, wh wh how should I spend my day? Uh, maybe I'll spend it aggravating myself, worrying myself, picking on myself, downing myself, um, whatever. You wouldn't consciously choose to do that to yourself because it's counterproductive. It not only will hurt your physical body, if you put your mind in that space, it will also distort your ability to think clearly and to respond openly to what's coming within and around you. So even though you wouldn't choose to do that, you are the one that's doing it. That's why I say there's only one, but the some of the circuits are arrested. So against your reason, our desire, our better judgment, we keep trashing ourselves. And this, the more we escalate the parameters of, of what we can think about, you know, we used to, a uh, uh, hundred years ago, 150, everything was still pretty pastoral. There were big city concentrations, but even in the cities, we didn't get around all that well. Um, you know, you, you, had, you mostly had to f live in an agrarian society, pay attention to the climate. Today, with electricity and, 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 and the lights and refrigeration and everything it brings, the mass media, well, the body's still operating on the same circuitry. But the influences that are, have, have created a great discrepancy between how we think and where we're still responding from. When we talk about feelings, we're talking about how you respond to what stimulates your awareness in any given moment. You may not be able to respond to something because you've been so shut down, locked up, conditioned, inhibited. No, no, I can't let myself think about that. I don't want to go there. That's, that's not in my ballpark. That's not in my belief system. Or you may be so open that you can mix and match, pick and choose to your heart's content in any way you like. Unfortunately, few people are that open. But as long as we stay subconsciously repressed the way we are, our bodies are taking the brunt of it, as is the global body of, of humanity in terms of the socioeconomics. And for us, we look at all the nonsense coming down. Dean says, well, why is it like this? Because people get into a position of competency. They have the intellectual skills, they have the, the luck of the circumstance, and they can take advantage of it. And they come up with something that gives them access, that facilitates their advantage. They may not know anything else. They may probably are, in their own way, a mass of repressed confusions. But, ha-ha, I'm on the upper tier. You know, I'm the one that gets to call the shots. They don't know how to look at the whole picture, not just intellectually, yeah. Everything gets reduced to what 
their advantage provides. Somebody comes up with something better, they're a competitor. Even if what the competitor has come up with would be better for everybody concerned, that's not because feelings have only, and this is very important, this is for you, for me, and for any person who has ever walked this planet. Feeling responses, as long as they stay locked into the subconscious, and that can easily be broken, but as long as they stay there, and they are there for 99.9% .9 of the population around the planet, at whatever level of development they're at, feelings have only one criterion for judgment, and that is either I get what I was patterned, conditioned, and programmed to feel I should want, and if I get it, it produces pleasure, I approach it and feel satisfied. Now, or I don't get what I was patterned or conditioned or programmed to feel I should want. And if I don't get it, then it produces pain. I try to avoid it, and I feel guilty because I'm not doing something right. Now, you're, what you've been conditioned and programmed to feel you should want may be totally crap. It may be detrimental to the well-being of your body, to the, to the equilibrium of your awareness, but once it's locked into place, the only right is in getting it. The only wrong is in not getting it. And this is where we don't understand what's going on. Feelings, when they dominate, can justify anything in relation to their irrationality. And, Dean, that's in answer to your question, that's why this what we see as insanity or the imbalances that are being produced the lopsided imbalances. That's where all this is coming from. Indeed. indeed. So I, on this feelings topic, if most people are programmed to be afraid of disease, can you see how the medical profession would build upon that? In other words, the advantage would be make people feel that they are disempowered so they will have to resort to what we have. And what we have is a, a drug, or what we have is a, uh, a way of masking what you're afraid of. This is a culture that has not dealt with these, the feelings that have been keeping them in control, will be susceptible to any of what is what is coming down from what we'd refer to as those in power, people that uh, are guiding this. And if those people that are seeking their advantage, would it not make sense then that everything that is built upon their medicine, food, is about gaining advantage for their position? So we're not going to win. We're not going to get our control back. We're not going to get our power back unless we realize we cannot play. What did Einstein say? that you cannot fight the problem with the consciousness that created it or the awareness that created it because at this point of our evolution we are in such a rapidly changing in a negative way as far as the environment goes a place that we have only to resort to the places where we would think that well, this is going to make me healthy. Healthy if I if I detoxify myself, if I clean myself, if I if I exercise, if I eat healthy food. Yeah, but at some level, you know that we're being poisoned. We're we're being we're being exposed to uh, particles that are harmful, poisons, uh, bacteria. It was mentioned earlier that uh, there's a new wave of Ebola uh, that's coming. Well, what? How are we going to position ourselves on the that gives us the awareness that we are being sucked in by something that is out of our control? And that's a question for you, Anne. Oh, thank you, Dean. Well, that's quite a question. Okay, you said make sense out of it. First of all, distinguish. If we sit, if we sit down and have a conversation, maybe a cup of tea or a glass of wine, no pressure on us, we want to kick around some ideas, we can probably be pretty reasonable if, we, if we're capable of that. But if you get too tired, too frustrated, too angry, too lonely, too horny. Something throws you off kilter. You're just exhausted and you can't maintain that mental perspective. Where do you go? You 
inadvertently revert back to these subconscious response patterns we call feelings. And they're gradients of those. It's very interesting to understand how they work. And it's that sort of Damocles, so to speak, that hangs over all of us. We think about God, truth, progress, you know, he, he, the, good, the, good for, the good for all. But we scratch ourselves and we bleed and we go, oh my God, I'm mortal. I can be hurt. I could be killed. And it's that constant threat, that fear that is played upon. Now, there is a difference between dealing with something in the moment, and you got to deal with it, hope you can deal with it well, and sitting around generating, emotionally masturbating, mental projections, and salting them with old feeling responses, either pro or negative, that seem to support. All of a sudden, you're not dealing with reality. You're dealing with these mind aspects that you're creating. It's not what's going on. As a matter of fact, you're not in the moment. You're not drawing any vitality from the moment. You're out of it. But once you get stuck in that kind of space, and most people are, well, all these unresolved fears that we've never learned to properly cope with come up. Um, it's it, really we're getting down to the threat of of dying and death, and, and nobody wants to think of that. Um, we could have a whole show just talking about what that means and where it comes from and what the implications are. But we're talking about all right. All this stuff is out there. Now we have to come back to the current pre prevailing medical model, which is a it's allopathic. It's drug-oriented. It was systematically rammed through various legislators by people who had no scientific understanding or knowledge. It was rammed through for the purpose of coalescing a means of making money. Do the pharmaceuticals produce some necessary things that can be life-saving? Undoubtedly. But if the bottom line is not bettering the quality of life and helping people, but it's in making money, which is just a means of access to secure power, then you don't want people well. You want them dependent on your product. This is a buyer-seller market. And this is what's been foistered on people. Because, as I said, as soon as your body doesn't feel good, as soon as there's pain, as soon as there's devitalization, as soon as you're having trouble breathing, you remember how human you are, and we haven't learned to cope with that. We, we have organizing principles. It, it, early times, a lot of them were religious. They always said, well, what's the main premise that runs through them all? Uh, you're, you're a miserable, screwed-up sinner, and unless you think this way and act this way, speak this party line, you're condemned. But if you do, then you don't get to feel better. You get to have a reason for justifying why you can be so miserable. Now, that's not to negate the beautiful aspirations and the sacred processes that have been instilled. It is to talk about the bureaucracy that sucks at those, not for the benefit of the people, but for the power systems that want to perpetuate themselves. But when you understand human consciousness itself, all of this becomes extremely obvious. The question becomes, what do we want to do about it? What can we do about it? Well... Yeah, I'm sure there are people who want to secure their position. And as I said, on the feeling level, this is why people don't understand the, what's called the sociopath or the psychopath. Because it, no matter how brilliant the intellect may be, and a person could be deranged but intellectually extremely capable, no matter how brilliant the person may be, if the feelings control things, you can justify anything, any kind of horror, because the only right is that you should get what you feel you, you want. You, you're, you've been conditioned to program. And that the basis of all that is sustaining who you are. And it's not really sustaining who you are. It's sustaining the thought of who you are. You're, when people think of death, they think, yeah, I, I won't be able to... To think anymore, unless there's another plane of existence, and I get to do the same thing in, in a whole different energy frequency. That's all fun. Right now, everything seems to be moving out of control. Some of the people on the show feel and have pointed out, and it it's, uh, has a validity, that this is planned. Yes, 
the, the, when you take away real psychological integration and you're stuck with a brilliant mind run by the irrationality of the subconscious impulses, that it's the big cultural approach. It's been there since the Stone Age, and it's time for us to outgrow it. But when you have that, anything can be justified. In, as to whatever secures my position and advantage. And so we want to think that the people we elect, the people that have the brains to put this stuff together and develop it, are have our best interests in mind. No, they're not that developed themselves. Just, just as a side thought, I, I, I laugh sometimes when I think of Ayn Rand's very intelligent, interesting work, a little bit two-dimensional, but very brilliant. But the one thing that's always left out by people that like to quote uh, Ms. Rand, is that her heroes are creative inventors who not only have the brilliance to see something that can contribute, but they take responsibility for making sure that no second-hander, no person who wants the parasite off of society, who doesn't understand these processes, gets control of them, that they're put into place in a way that they're meant to be. Now, there's a lot of people that talk about the kind of rugged individualism that is moder modernly uh, exponated through her writings. But they always leave out the fact that the very people who are using it are the people she describes as the gangs, the political gangs and parasites. Anyway, just some thoughts, Dean. Please, pick it up. Absolutely. Um, the justify misery, justify you know, the hysterical uh, perception when you were bringing that up, that anything can be justified on the feeling level and all that is being done um, in regards to how we have allowed so much to take us over. Uh, this, is our, this is our inability to recognize our outer sources, our, our if you will, the, uh, the places where you're going with the, the parasites in, in, in a place of people in power, be they government or the medical profession or what have you, in agriculture, all of these things seem to be out of what would be out of our control. Uh, that's where I wanted to ask you next is if we're dealing with things that are out of our control and we're in a, a place where we recoil, we, we get guarded, uh, we're not convinced that we can have any influence. What becomes the steps that we we use to regain our sight on on how we're able to harness the energy that we need to be able to provide ourselves to get access to have power or to to have sight that says, okay, this is what we're dealing with. How do we proceed? Next, with realizing that something's bothering us, something's in the way, something's keeping us from from being comfortable or still or or able to take on the next challenge. Okay, well, um, any anything but satisfaction is an inner lie. I'm talking about on an emotional level. Um, you know, I would I always say health is seductive. Not because somebody's a good talker, but if I can introduce you into the experience of a better state of body, vitality, energy, a better state of mind, clarity, extended computation, perception, if it, it, more heightened sensation, better experience, if I can introduce you into that, once it's been introduced into your nervous system, you'll never be satisfied till it becomes accessible to you in a clear way. But what lies in the way of all that are the fears that we have. You know, fear is what's governing everybody from the people on the top of the heap to the people on the, on the bottom of the heap. And fear is always, at one level or another of consciousness, a defended misunderstanding. It's, you're not right, you're not wrong, it's not good or bad. You're locked into a way of processing, might have worked for you at one particular point in your development or experience, it's not working now. But in not wanting to be wrong, be, feeling you need to be right, you know, you become armored and desensitized. So what I would say is very important, what I'd like to seduce everybody to in the most open and honorable of, of ways, 
is increased intelligence, not just more intellectual palabra. You know, a lot of people can talk about a lot of things, but they understand very little. I want to see the nervous system, the human nervous system, freed up. In other words, where your feelings, all these levels of response become clear and open and adaptively malleable to you so that you can, on the most base level, use them to start to augment your physiology so that everything you're eating and doing and exercising and whatever you're doing, you work with it to, to make the body hum and purr, which in turn allows you to enjoy all your efforts more clearly so that you no longer are pushed around by vague feelings that shut you down, such as fear, doubt, confusion, anxiety, guilt, and shame. Imagine how, how much that has slurred the quality of your life. You're free of it. And you find ways of looking at everything you're doing, and you can see where they came on, not just intellectually comprehend them, but trace them back down, release the automatic mechanism by which you were locked in and then start to replace them so until you come into a comfort zone that allows you to feel fully functional comfortably with yourself to open up the intellect so it's not running away with you so you can use these things more passionately more comprehensively more expansively but also to know the point of peace that centering within the human psyche, so that if there's something to do, by all means, do it. Think, feel, sense. But if there's nothing going on, or if your system's overloaded, without denying anything, avoiding anything, repressing anything, you can come exquisitely into the moment. Your body quiesces. You can even, if you know how to, start to work with whatever stresses you put in the body, so that you can take more advantage of the nutrients you're taking in whether it's food or more extended supplements, so that you can let yourself catch up and see what's actually going on. Have the means to quickly take apart anything that's bothering you and start to replace it. Now imagine if you can't be pushed around by fear, that you know you can involve yourself, open yourself up, interact with people to your heart's content, or pull back anytime you want to be in your own space, and if there's a confusion, straighten it out. Well, you're no longer afraid to interact. Most of the time, we don't have relationships with people. We have mutual conspiracies by, by identification. Uh, you don't blow my covers up. I won't blow yours. Look, we're wearing the same clothes. I, I get the same designer label in my, my outfits um, because we're insecure. But once you come into a place of inner security, balanced awareness, not as wishful thinking, gee, wouldn't it be nice, rainbows and, 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 and unicorns, and no, none of that. When you can clearly move into your senses, your feelings, your, your intellect, your thought patterns, to any degree or combination you choose, only for as long as you choose, or stay exquisitely centered in the moment without feeling compelled, you can move in and out at will, well, then you're ready to play because you can't be trapped and cheated. Right now, society, it'd be because the people at top are scared. They want to maintain their position. Understandable. There is nothing new in this. Whatever organizing system we created throughout the ages, whether it's royalty or re religion, you know, whatever systems, now it's corporate and economic, it's still operating under the same constraints. I'd like to see these systems. We don't get rid of them. We want to refine them. Just as you want to refine your life to where you feel deliciously good about yourself, comfortable, clear, vital, and in control. That's the kind of process we're talking about that people need to go through so that whatever your interests, your inclinations, your dispositions, and your circumstances, whether it's yours to take on the whole world or just yours to live a decent life, you feel at ease with it and you are ready to play. How about that, Dean? Hey, play we do, Am. Uh, <laughs> we can't enjoy our lives without having some play. Uh, what I oftentimes have is people that are so usually... Uh, coming to me with stress problems on some level, they're they're always in their head. Uh, it's it's a very common issue. 
too much going on in my life for me to spend any time to play or, or to enjoy myself because I've got too much to worry about. Well, we, we have to take control of what we're doing to our bodies. And then on the physical level, you'll see it used to be back in the 70s, the number one reason for death in this country was called, it was the heart attack. And just as, uh, you know, in Monday morning, it was three times more, at least back then, more heart attacks uh, occurred in, in the morning of Monday because uh, people didn't want to go to work. They were, uh, they were stressing out. They were getting too anxious. They were dreading having to walk into the office, having to go to work. Didn't give themselves the opportunity to rest or sleep or get what they needed. From the physical end of this, talking about how what Am is pre presenting here, is that our bodies are under assault from a lot of different angles from the environment. That's a stress. It's under assault from a lot of different levels on what media is being, you know, telling us what we should be afraid of, or telling us, you know, that, uh, that, that this is the next coming war. This is the next. Uh, you know, uh, disease, what is, how are our coping mechanisms able to handle any of these stressors? And what Am is pointing out here is that imagine a body that's healthy enough to take on whatever challenges are coming at it. And in a reasonable way, we're, we're not talking about isolating yourself on an island somewhere without, uh, you know, any contact to the rest of the world, no, no microwaves, you know, no um, uh, GM, genetically modified food. Uh, there's no radiation coming down on you. We don't and cannot live in a bubble. Uh, one of uh, <laughs> Stephen King's books uh, talked about this, um, this living in a bubble in a city. It was surrounded in a bubble. But anyway, we're not talking about that. We're talking about making it clear that what is coming in is something that we are capable of handling. And that means that even if we do have some radiation coming down in the rain or in our oceans, we don't want to freak out about it. We don't want to lose our grip uh, on ourselves and let it control us. And there are so many of these things that we can become susceptible to. We don't lose sight of what Am's message is here, which is that fear will suck you in in all of these, you know, uh, what we would refer to uh, in, in the news media or uh, in, uh, in, in, in medical alerts and so forth, we need to be aware that these are happening. But so it was easy for me when I started uh, to see trends that, that people were out of control. And the ones that were supposedly in authority that were directing the people on how to handle these things were also out of control. Yes, I mean the medical professionals. And these were not, you know, directed in an intelligent way from the standpoint of, you know, being able to, okay, here's how you adequately prepare yourself for something. Here's how you adequately handle something. Tests and, and more tests become a justification of the, of, of the treatments. These are great tools. They're useful. But it should not be the way that we look at ourselves as being healed. And when Am and I don't like to uh, emote or, 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 you know, spend a lot of time on saying how disrupted things are, are out of imbalance things are in the medical field, uh, this is one that we spend the most time on. But we do want to give you not only the sense, but the realization that these tools that we have not been trained. You were not raised with these tools, probably. Uh, you were uh, given <coughs> inadequate ways of dealing with your fears. And if that's the case, then how are we, and this is another question for Am, how are we going to position ourselves in a, a world that is so toxic? How are we going to enhance uh, not only the, the attitude, that we have in saying, yeah, I want to be healthy. I, I don't want to be just controlled by disease. Or I, I, I want to be able to know what it is that, that makes my 
my uh, my immune system stronger or to fight off whatever is coming to me is it is it a fear that is driving us to making these decisions or is it the awareness that the fear is sucking us into those disease patterns well it's it's a com- it's a kind of a combination what you do to the body affects the mental perspective what you do to the mind affects the body it doesn't matter which comes first um, they're always mutually simultaneous but there is a, a, an order as to to where it's originating from sometimes I've had people come to me who are really have serious physical imbalances creating de- deterioration degenerative processes and they have to be addressed immediately but the question is on the physical level where is the body susceptible? What part of the body, what organs and system, glandular systems were involved? What is in excess or deficiency? What is or is not doing its processes? Why, why was the body breaking down? But as I start to bring people out of these states, start to help them reintegrate the body, and part of it's an education process. It's your body and it's your mind, and the only way you're really going to be comfortable with them is when you at least understand enough about what you're asking from them and how they operate to participate with that consciously. The beast needs a good master or mistress. But then they come to a place, well, you can see you maybe had bad habits, bad information you didn't understand, you stress the body, but why were you susceptible to being like that? And then eventually this will bring up the ways you look at yourself, the things you avoid, the things you tell yourself, all the fears. And by the way, you're never afraid of what you understand. You may have to deal with it, may may require a lot from you, but you're not afraid of it. You're always afraid of what you don't understand but think or feel you do. But once you do that, you get to a place where, okay, let's look at how you are looking at things and why again are you hurting yourself this way why are you limiting yourself and then it's a a question of if they want to of breaking free clearing that so they can start to reformulate how they want to be not as a something written on uh, stone tablets but as an adaptive intelligent process and make the adjustments in the body on the other hand sometimes people come to me and they are so distraught so anxious that you have to deal with that first. You have to look at, at, at what's going on and how they got themselves in that and help them get out of it. But as they do start to come out of it, they look around and say, whoa, I don't feel so good because they haven't taken proper care of their body. Because all these, we talk about gut emotions. Because regardless of what you think about or avoid thinking about, everything you feel create, registers viscerally, creates tissue disposition. So then it may be if you want to be able to maintain this state of mind because mind and body feed into each other, you're going to have to correct some of the imbalances on the body. As I said, whether it's coming from the the emotional distortions or whether it's coming from physical imbalances, they're mutually simultaneous. Now, it's helpful to know these things. I grew up around a lot of doctors. Um, uh, that was medical doctors. That was uh, kind of almost worship. You know, this is the thing to be and the thing to do. But I was very aware that they were not particularly happy, that they were not particularly healthy. Uh, I was interested in understanding how they thought, but I could see they didn't have it together. I found this consistently. But we haven't been taught how to deal with our bodies and what you don't understand you're potentially afraid of. You, um, now, the way do you get out of a trap of fear? There, there are two things about fear. You may have heard me mention this in the past. There is a primal lock. It's a neurological development that happens in the early part of our maturation when we're coming online, usually between three and five, where there's a vague, life-persecuting sense of threat that keeps shutting us down gets locked into the, the, the neurological apparatus. It doesn't have to be there, but this is what we've inherited from our primitive beginnings. Um, that's uh, something that needs to be dealt with, and once it's dealt with, it's done. And that fear is a sabotage mechanism, that if you get too strong, 
too smart, too capable. If you move in a more open, expansive direction, the fear comes up. It's irrational. You don't know where it's coming from. And you shut yourself down. You sabotage yourself in some way or you do a trade-off. Or if you become good in one aspect of your life, you feel somehow compelled to mess up in another, which keeps you from really capitalizing on all what's available to you. And this is what dogs everybody. doesn't have to, but it is. Then you have all the little nuances of fear that come up, the anxiety and everything. And they are simply a product of defended misunderstanding. You are you have an idea. Now, your ideas, your perspective may be more advanced, may be um, more sustained, more information, more facts and figures, more validation than anybody else around you. And like it or not, you know, circumstances may require, well, (laughs) you got to go with what's available to you. But you will only get into the emotional difficulty within yourself when you stop seeing it as a range of motion to be potentially explored and experimented with, and you start to say, yeah, this is right. This is what makes me smart. This is what makes me sexy. This is what makes me holy. This is what makes me powerful. Once you lock into that, either by intellectual design, and you may be intellectually developed, disciplined enough to be able to analyze and take apart a faulty uh, premise, a faulty thought system, but more insidiously for most people, just about everybody, these fears are coming from defended feelings. Uh, I don't care what you say. I, I know, well, whatever, this is the way I feel about things. And as soon as you need to be right, you don't want to look at anything that threatens that, that might make you wrong. You start to armor yourself. You start to become desensitized. You, know, you start to develop tunnel vision. Instead of having access to the whole ball of wax, it's like a self, you know, self-persecuting prophecy. You know, you're avoiding your fears, which means you're always threatened by the fact that you have to avoid something. But because it's subconscious, you don't recognize it. Now, breaking the grip of this, not involving your nervous system, starts to free up energy with a little bit of intelligent technique, and I do emphasize intelligent. It's a lot of wishy-washy stuff going on out there, but stuff that, that really is comprehensibly sensible. With intelligent technique, and all technique is, whatever you're bringing to bear, it's focus and concentration, you can start to augment the body and the mind. This is what whether you are illiterate and uneducated or whether you've got five PhDs in uh, neuropsychology, this is what will help advance your capabilities, good for you if you've got them, or free you up so that at whatever level you are operating at, however driven you are, you can do it more comfortably. And right now you don't have that. Everybody feels threatened So everybody and everything becomes a threat, anything that would undermine them. Fear is what's running the show, and it needs to be replaced with comprehensive experiential understanding. Uh, Am, the the point you make about being threatened, are we being threatened then when we refer to, okay, we have... We have too many, um, too many things to deal with in regards to uh, to being overwhelmed by our environment. Uh, there's there's too much going on in my life. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not capable of handling the onslaught of of the emotional drains. Let's just say, and what drains you is anger. What drains you is fear, and what drains you is being worried. What drains you uh, is is being uh, fixated, pensive. Uh, so, would the would the way to stop this? And this is something you mentioned in the Geigers before. Is whenever it does feel, at any level, something that you doubt or you're confused about or you're afraid of, or you have fear about. That's when you you realize it's got control of you. Isn't that correct? Well, you realize, Dean, that you don't understand something. 
Okay, if you don't understand, then you don't understand. It doesn't mean you don't have perspectives. But there's real understanding means you've basically stood under the experience until you can see exactly what it is, how it's constructed, its interactive range of motion, how you can independently access it. So you can do that and you can mix and match at will. You can pick it up, put it down, rearrange it, or leave it alone. It's there if you want to use it. You don't have to always be reminding yourself it's there because you're afraid you'll lose it. If you're afraid, you don't understand. And that allows you to deal with things without all this inhibition and all the physiological derailing of our systems. You know, you don't have any problems on that level until you think you do. Now, there are real problems. You know, if, if suddenly a sinkhole appears and, and it's a problem, you've got to deal with it. Or if, if some animal's gone rabid, you've got to deal with it. But basically what most people are dealing with are not real problems. They're the projected, recycled fears that they keep saying that they're in control of or they're avoiding. So if I tell people, listen, I'd like you to sit there and for 30 seconds just 30 seconds, not have a thought go through your mind, and well, they say, okay, and then I'll watch them, and they can't do it, because they're thinking, okay, I'm sitting here, uh, I'm not going to have a thought going through my mind. That's thinking. In other words, you need to be able to quiesce the system, both physically and mentally, emotionally, so that you can come back into the moment and see what's going on. See how, where you're tied what your disposition is, your tendencies, where they're serving you or not serving you, and break them. Not deny them, that would be just locking you more into the same. Dismantle them and replace them, and keep replacing them till you are really operating at the comfort level of your unique individual dynamic. And that involves learning to control, not avoid or repress, to control the workings of your own nervous system, the levels of perception that are available to us as human beings. Now, we do not control. We are pushed around. We are in an incessant war inside of ourselves, juggling, battling, defending, running, alibying, compensating. And these are poor coping mechanisms. If you understand human consciousness, what it is and how it operates, how it's developed, you can see where each and every one of these mechanisms came from, why they locked in the way they did, what they offered, what they denied access to. And it's part of our human heritage. There's a lot of good stuff, a lot of good information there. But... Of course, what, since fear control things, and, and uh, I'm afraid of being denied or, or being ostracized or not getting my share or being, you know, whatever it is, I've got to find a way to secure my space, primitively, reactively, unconsciously, Stone Age-wise. It's just making sure you can defend your territory, making sure you can get to the food and water, you know, but we've overlaid that through the years. It's still there, but we've overloaded it with, with culture, with, with social programming, with all kinds of civilized attempts. And there's a lot of brilliant systems that have noticed this and come up with various techniques which can help a person center. The problem is that they all have bureaucracies built up around them. But here we are at a time where we can now finally at last access potentially all the information from any culture anywhere on the planet. But we keep straining it through the same filter of a derailed nervous system that is being heightened in its distress by the fact that so much is available. Again, the war between how you think and how you feel. How do you cope? You rationalize. Well, if I didn't have to put up with this and he'd be more like that and she wouldn't do this and they would be like this and what are we doing? We're rationalizing. Who do we rationalize to? We rationalize the negative feelings we have, that no matter how intelligent or scientifically validated our thought processes may seem to be, at least in one level, uh, in one condition, we still don't feel comfortable. And Ace, as I said, no matter what you believe, your body bears the brunt of that. So to gain peace in ourselves and between each other, there, since we can't do it with each other if we don't do it within ourselves, 
it's time for us to learn to center. Now, there is a danger there. A lot of times people are trying to get away from their discomfort level, and they find a technique that helps them extract themselves. And, oh, what a relief. Oh, I feel better. Oh, yeah. I mean, back there is that hung-up person that's always tormenting himself. I don't want to go back to that. Okay, I'll be good. I'll eat this way. I'll deny this. I'll, I'll do whatever. Just don't let me go back to being that person. Now, they may get some relief and even some expanded experience, but it's locked into an avoidance pattern. It can become nihilistic where everything's in denial. You breathe in, you breathe out. You can't breathe in all the time. You can't breathe out all the time. It's the cycle of life. The synapses in the brain fire. They have to recharge. Everything is, has a periodicity to it. And so learning that place where you're neither one nor the other so that you can see both and bring quiet and, and, and regain your strength. That's extremely important for every person on this planet, whatever they want to do with it, whatever their lifestyle, their urges. And, and of course, most of what people are processing uh, are not to their satisfaction. They don't know how to satisfy themselves. Guys, but I, I, I hate to break in, yeah. but, you know... You know, I, I, you guys have always got some, and I, I gotta, I, I gotta tell you, it, it's, it, it's a fascinating discussion. And if I could, if I could go another hour, I think you could probably fill it. But we're coming very close to the end of our time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gary. Dean, uh, Dean, why don't you get a quick last word in there, and then I want to, I want to give Am a, a, a brief opportunity to do a little book promotion. Perfect. Thank you. Am has been talking about what. And I did this intentionally to raise the questions of what made us susceptible. And what he points out is that we have become under control because we were susceptible. We were weak. We were unable to use what we were not. We were, we were not given the tools to be able to recognize that we had the ability to be in control. And over the next series, the next several shows, we'll be talking about how we gain our power back, how we get it so that things don't overwhelm us. We don't avoid these. And what to do when something does make us uncomfortable, how we prepare ourselves. So if you're interested in our radio shows, you simply just need to go to either one of our websites. Just go to www.acutone.com for me and am. Right. Thank you, Dean. Yes, you can visit my website. It's www.lifegame. Dot com, And uh, you'll find all kinds of things there. It's uh, not something you can just look at. I mean, there's, there are, so I haven't quite caught up with the most recent shows I've been doing, but there's an archive of some of the shows we've done. There's a podcast library. You know, I've, uh, there, the availability of two of my books are there, Cruising the Epiphany Highway. Volume 1 and Volume 2. There's some sample excerpts, some that I've read, some you can just read if you want to give you a taste of what's there. Um, but if you want to understand the development of uh, human consciousness and why we're so shut down, uh, the, my most recent one, Cruising Volume 2, is in four sections. And the first part, uh, which is Enlightenment Guaranteed or Your Desperation Back, it deals with the healing art and the development of consciousness and how it's the problems we have and what's involved in bringing it online. So if you'd like to look at that, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the book. Um, and, of course, I'd be interested in hearing from many of you with questions or considerations. And uh, thank you for allowing us to share some, uh, some thoughts with you. Well, thank you both. I do appreciate your participation in the marathon, and uh, hope we can count on you again for next month. Uh, Am, are you are you game for roundtable this afternoon? Oh, I am so game. All righty, and uh, Dean, any chance I can twist your arm? Uh, you can twist away. It's all going to depend. Doctor Lorraine Hurley is here visiting, and we're putting together a project on synchronized intention which we'll talk about next month when we put it together so it's possible and i'll try my best to make it all right i'll go ahead and ring in we'll cross our fingers and and hope we can uh, we can put it together but uh, we have run a little over time so gentlemen i'm gonna have to bid you good afternoon y'all take care now thank you you're listening to unitedwestrike.com radio don't buy don't comply that's why unitedwestrike.com radio all right.